uh, I'd like to introduce the next uh, speaker who's going to tell us uh, about uh, what is beyond the measurement of total kidney volume, which we have used as a very uh, important biomarker, but the next generation, a second generation of volumetric. Uh, so our speaker is Dr. Tim Klein from the Mayo Clinic, and she, he has been really instrumental in developing a lot of very advanced volumetric that he's gonna tell us about. Thank you very much, Tim. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Definitely a tough crew to follow, um, but I'll try to do it justice. And thank you so much for the, for the opportunity here. So I'm going to go a bit um, um, more in depth in terms of what we're uh, trying to do, developing new uh, image acquisition and new image uh, analysis protocols in radiology. Um, so let's... Let's start a little bit with, um, I think we've highlighted pretty well, obviously, the importance of measurements of total kidney volume. Uh, again, just to highlight that this is uh, an approved prognostic biomarker um, for uh, PKD research and clinical trials. Obviously, we're using this to track uh, disease progression and evaluate uh, therapy effectiveness. And really, MRI has become the uh, imaging modality of choice. Um, and so for some time now, um, we have developed uh, automated tools to perform these measurements. As Dr. Khalili uh, described, you know, this takes on the order, it can take on the order of 30 minutes to an hour, uh, depending on the severity of the disease, to actually manually trace these. And I think our radiologist uh, colleagues have more interesting things to do. Um, so one thing we've done uh, is developed an AI tool to perform these measurements uh, automatically. Since developing and publishing on this, um, we have moved this uh, into the clinical practice, um, and this uh, basically allows us, as soon as a patient is scanned, we automatically route the images to the AI tool, uh, generate uh, a segmentation that can be reviewed by the radiologist, and ultimately create a summary report that can be shared with our uh, nephrologist, clinician, colleagues that are caring for the patients. But I think the important thing that we're really talking about today is just this wide uh, phenotypic variability that we see in these patients. So obviously we have patients uh, that can have very similar uh, total kidney volumes, but very different uh, cystic phenotypes as we've seen already um, in the three presentations before. So patients with similar total kidney volume, uh, but very different uh, in terms of number and size of the cysts. And so a lot of the work um, that we're doing is is to try to take uh, images like this that we're constantly uh, assessing in a qualitative manner uh, and really trying to provide quantitative metrics that can help uh, with uh, staging of the disease as well as thinking about uh, subsequent progression and potentially helping with uh, treatment decisions. So this is just highlighting really the wide uh, phenotypic variability that we see uh, in all of these patients here and showing what uh, can be visualized then if we do a rendering of the kidney and the liver as well. So one thing that we uh, worked on was then to develop an automated uh, tool to go beyond uh, kidney volumes and actually uh, individually trace in three dimensions uh, the individual cysts. And this gives us uh, an opportunity to now provide some of these quantitative metrics like how many cysts, what is the cyst uh, size distribution, what is overall cyst volume versus parenchyma volume, and really start to provide a lot more quantitative metrics from even just a single radiology image. I won't go into too much detail in terms of how we um, necessarily develop these models, but probably the more important thing is that actually curation of the data is the most important part. So from the kind of AI or machine learning side, we develop uh, code that can basically take in an image and try to produce then uh, this output of individually traced cysts. And essentially, we let the computer itself learn how to replicate what a, what a human would do in order to create uh, what we call an instance level segmentation, where now we can get out individual cis number, cis size distribution, et cetera. So we worked on this and developed the tool uh, specifically for MR images. 
Um, and here's just showing some examples. So a lot of what we do then to try to validate the tools is compare to uh, expert readers, compare you know, what are the differences between two different humans performing these tracings, and essentially try to get the AI tool to be able to perform at the same level. And this is just showing some uh, visual representations of what that looks like. But then really the cool thing that this enables is for us to then look at, you know, what is the clinical utility of these metrics? And so using this AI tool, uh, we looked at the CRISP cohort to see how can these metrics improve on uh, our prognostic models. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight here is then this typically uh, adds additional um, uh, considerations in terms of the quality of the imaging. So when we went back, obviously this is a retrospective uh, study now from a couple decades ago, uh, but just noting some of the uh, imaging issues that you would see, such as uh, potentially low cyst contrast, um, some motion uh, that might occur uh, during the actual image acquisition, as well as considerations in terms of the slice thickness that the image was acquired at. So e even for these retrospective studies, there were some images that we uh, could not uh, include in the analysis because, again, what we're trying to do is as accurate of a, of a counting, cyst size measurement, et cetera. But what this enables then for us is to look at um, uh, additional metrics. So going beyond total kidney volume now, we can obviously do things like cyst number. Uh, we can look at renal parenchyma segmentations, uh, as well as a metric we call the cyst parenchyma surface area, which is essentially looking at the surface area of cysts that's adjacent to seemingly healthy uh, kidney tissue. So this helps to uh, limit the impact, for instance, of exophytic cysts. Uh, which likely have uh, much less impact on overall kidney function. Um, I think this is a nice slide that really highlights uh, what we were going after uh, with this study where uh, essentially on the top row uh, and the bottom row, we have matching patients that have the same uh, kidney volumes. So essentially, if you look at the two yellow, two green, et cetera, uh, these are all cases that have the same kidney volume, but as you can see, very different uh, phenotypical patterns. And this is essentially what we're trying to then quantify with these um, newer uh, imaging parameters. If we look at, um, in particular, doing a predictive model where we're just using height-adjusted total kidney volume to then predict uh, the eight-year slope of EGFR, you can see we have an R-squared of 0.19. If we look at some of the uh, more detailed metrics like cyst number or cyst uh, parenchyma surface area, now we're getting a, a relationship or an R squared of about 0.26. So we're significantly improving uh, how we're predicting these patients are gonna progress. And I think from the clinical perspective, uh, it's very easy to tell that if you look at what would be considered uh, very severe patients on the top right there, there's still, plenty of uh, healthy renal parenchyma, and you would just qualitatively predict that they're gonna um, progress uh, in a much different fashion than those patients on the bottom right. I uh, so wanted to highlight that we then um, moved this work um, more recently to also doing the same type of quantification um, in CT images as well. Um, so this is a, a, a recent study that we did, um, just some details about um, the cohort that we looked at. Um, again, basically trying to develop an AI tool for uh, doing things like the instance level uh, segmentation of CIS. Um, won't go into too much detail with the, um, the modeling here, but just wanted to highlight that um, you know, now we have also the opportunity to do the same type of an anal analysis uh, in CT images. Uh, we developed the model to uh, work with non-contrast images for doing the instance level segmentation in the liver, and then contrast images were required for doing uh, this type of analysis uh, for the kidney cysts. But again, really what we're going after is doing a, a true you know, comprehensive characterization uh, of the kidney. 
Um, and in this case, really looking at how can we extract as much rich information from a single uh, radiological image. So I highlighted already, you know, what we can do with organ segmentation, uh, instant cyst segmentation, as well as uh, calculations like the cyst parenchyma surface area here. Uh, but we've also looked at some other uh, opportunities for digging a little bit deeper um, into what's going on with the kidneys uh, in the form of uh, texture analysis or radiomic features. Uh, so quickly, really what this is, is, is a way for us to quantify uh, spatial distributions within the images um, in order to do things like maybe probe microscopic cyst burden. So let's look at, you know, regions within the image that maybe appear to be a healthy parenchyma, uh, but based on the image resolution, uh, likely there's microscopic cyst burden uh, that's sort of brewing behind the scenes. An image texture uh, is a method that could help us actually extract that as a quantifiable metric. Uh, so we actually did this um, uh, study in a, in a similar manner to what we did with that instance uh, cyst segmentation approach, where essentially what we wanted to do uh, was look at what is the added value um, of image texture over uh, in particular total kidney volume. So here you can see uh, we basically had a predictive model that had age, uh, EGFR, and height adjusted total kidney volume. You can see the relationship uh, with a model to the EGFR percent change um, and an eight year follow up in this case. And then the improvement if we incorporate just a few metrics from uh, texture analysis, how much um, more we could improve those predictive models. And we really think that, that you know, it's, it's helping us do things like potentially probe microscopic cyst burden, uh, as well as potentially fibrosis as well. So I mentioned a lot of things in terms of what we're trying to do with routinely acquired uh, imaging, but we're also uh, you know, investigating a lot of uh, new approaches for, for image acquisitions. Uh, so in this case, highlighting um, some work again from, from a, a number of years ago, but looking at uh, quantitative MR techniques. So in general, as Dr. Khalili uh, highlighted some of the differences between the different image modalities, there's also within MR a lot of ways to try to do uh, quantification of things uh, like potentially tissue stiffness, uh, looking at tissue oxygenation, and on the right showing uh, a method for doing four-dimensional flow anal analysis, which we're interested in uh, for exploring, you know, the potential for doing things uh, like automating renal blood flow measurements and helping to standardize those the same way that we have for, for doing measurements like total kidney volume. Um, we've also heard a lot about um, these questions around uh, body composition or BMI in this case. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities then in the radiological imaging space uh, to dig a bit, bit deeper um, in terms of quantifying uh, distributions of fat. So doing things like looking at uh, vit visceral adipose tissue. Um, here just highlighting um, an approach that we developed for automatically uh, basically distinguishing the different regions from images. Uh, this was originally developed in CT, uh, but has been expanded to MR as well. And it has also uh, facilitated already a number of studies just looking at how uh, these body composition uh, metrics also associate with disease severity. Um, so wanted to touch on, you know, some of the other opportunities that we have um, from the radio, from the imaging standpoint. So beyond uh, kidney segmentation, cyst segmentation, there's obviously a lot of opportunities for doing things like cyst classification. So showing in the bottom left here how we could uh, potentially separate uh, cysts such as hemorrhagic or proteinaceous cysts uh, from the images, oftentimes using information from, for example, the T1 and the T2 image. Um, it's already been highlighted a bit in previous talks, but here you can really see how you could use that information from the two scans to differentiate uh, simple cysts from, from proteinaceous cysts as well. I think another uh, big opportunity is uh, being able to do things like automatically identify malignancies as well. So here, uh, not in the case of a, a polycystic kidney disease patient, but I think this will be 
a really good opportunity moving forward, just seeing how difficult it is uh, to be able to identify these type of pathologies uh, in the case of patients affected with PKD, and really trying to develop tools that can automatically help us identify um, these malignancies. I uh, just wanted to highlight some other, you know, opportunities that we could think about exploring um, in the space of PKD. Um, this was some other work um, that we've done uh, in, in, in our department to automate uh, renal stone reporting um, in our practice. And so in this case, we can utilize a lot of the tools that we've developed in the space of PKD, you know, to do automatic identification of the kidneys, automatically identifying uh, stones, and then uh, automatically reporting out uh, the burden of stones, in this case, uh, providing metrics in terms of number of stones in the right, left, and both kidneys, as well as sort of a histogram breakdown for the, the stone size uh, distribution. So here you can see reporting out stones under two millimeters, uh, two to four millimeters, five to 10, and greater than 10 as well. Um, one other opportunity that I think um, is, is getting a lot of interest now is looking at uh, what we can do with uh, ultrasound. In this case, um, there's been a fair amount of work looking at 3D ultrasound. Um, in particular, you know, can we use this for, for doing things like volumetric measurements the same as what we're doing uh, with MRI? We've actually had um, a really good experience with, with looking at comparing uh, the two modalities. I think there's a lot of uh, potential applications here in the, the pediatric uh, patient populations. I think the important things uh, in terms of limitations are obviously for, for very severe patients. It's very difficult to actually acquire uh, the full uh, kidney within the acquisition. So there, there are certainly still limitations, um, but we are seeing very strong correlations between what we're seeing between uh, the 3D ultrasound as well as the MRI uh, in terms of volumetric measurements. All right, so with that, um, I just wanted to highlight, you know, I think there's clearly an important opportunity to improve and standardize the reporting of radiographic findings for patients affected by PKD. Um, there's a lot of work going into new image acquisition and analysis approaches uh, being developed to better uh, really refine prognostic models. Um, and then obviously uh, incorporating AI tools will help us improve our clinical management and decision making, uh, as well as support more comprehensive clinical trials as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Tim, uh, yeah. for making the uh, session so interesting and also caught up on time. <laughs> so we now have actually some extra time. I want to, because these methods are really quite interesting, I want to see if there's any questions uh, from the audience. Yeah. yeah, I went a little fast, so hopefully. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The AI tool requires deep learning, so how do you acquire the data to teach the machine? Yep, so, so in all the cases that I've shown, we typically need a human annotator. So we have a radiologist or image analyst actually trace you know, kidneys in some number of cases. So actually our original model that we developed for the kidney segmentation, the first one back in 2017, we had like 2,000 images that had kind of the expert tracings, and then we trained the model from that. Um, I think we've gotten better with the way that we're doing our models. So for instance, the CT, like instant cyst one that I showed, we had 100 cases that we developed the model. But obviously, trying to get that um, you know, expert level annotated data for individually tracing cysts in 3D, it took da days, if not weeks, for like a single image. So yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. But that's the most important part, is getting you know, expert annotations to use for your reference standard, I would say. Yeah, yeah but great question. It, thank you. It's a fascinating and exciting Technology, technological advancement. But if I push everybody back into the clinical trenches, yeah. how does it enhance our clinical ability to care for patients? I, I always bring us back to the, the cutoff line when we're talking about treatment, you know, a basic TKV above which we treat, below which we don't. 
And for the average patient, an ultrasound can tell me that. Yeah. Where, where are we going with this technology? I, I mean, I think to, to provide better metrics for you to make that clinical decision is really where we want to go. So, you know, right now we've developed a lot of these tools. I think a lot of the utility is going to take some time to establish, right? TKB took a very long time to be kind of an approved metric, but I see it so often when, you know, clinicians, it's between the B and C and, you know, should we treat? And then as we were showing with some of those phenotypic patterns where it's a patient with large kidney volumes, but it's attributed to maybe a handful of exophytic cysts, I think that changes your clinical decision-making already, in my opinion, but we want to provide you with quantitative information so you're not making guesses or you're not doing it qualitatively, right? You have the quantitative metrics to say, based on your cyst number, size distribution, and kidney volume, I'm going to recommend X instead of just TKB. Exactly. Yep. So, Tim, I want to ask you at the Mayo Clinic, so when you do the... Uh, automated segmentation for total kidney volume, do, do you automatically subtract it out the exocytic cyst volume? We, we aren't doing that currently, okay. no, no, no. Um, we would like to get to the point of having a lot of these kind of instance level, like provide a better report to Dr. Torres than mm -hmm. beyond just kidney volume. But right now in our clinical practice, it's kidney and liver volumes. Right. Yep. And, and do you routinely measure liver volume as well? We do, yep, oh, okay. yep, yep, yep. yep.